they are just a collection of individuals. Now, they're a collection of individuals, of course, that take 60% of my income. And that's, of course, wrong because we know the uses to which they put that money are not <laughs> strictly defending my life, liberty, and property. They're not all moral purposes. In fact, most of the things in which government's engaging uh, these days, most of those things are utterly uh, wrong and, and are an abuse, of course, of physical force. But why might it be appropriate? Why might it be even um, necessary, morally necessary, for a person uh, to collect money from another person? Or for a government to collect money from another person? Well, let's think this through. Justice is, is, the, is the principle in which every person uh, is the beneficiary of his own rational good conduct and is the sole, uh, the sole victim of his own irrational wrongful conduct. Now, let's say that somebody has harmed you. Uh, or let's, better yet, let's just say that somebody's harmed someone in your family and you're extremely, passionately uh, angry about this. Now, if you were to be just not only to the other person but to yourself, you have to make sure that uh, A, you get the right person. You don't, you don't punish someone who hasn't done anything wrong. You have to use all of your rational faculty, all of the evidence provided, all the physical evidence provided to determine who did this horrible thing to your family. And that's not a light duty. That's a very onerous, very mentally demanding duty. You then also have, it's a duty to yourself, not to others, it's a duty to yourself. It's a duty that's required if you're to survive in this world. And also to survive in this world, it's important uh, that you reward the good and, and that you punish, or at least deny reward, uh, to vice and, and, and evil. So, how do you know, let's say you've identified the right person, and you're in this very passionate, passionate state. I mean, some adult strikes your child, some adults might feel like killing that adult, never mind striking him. It's a very human thing. That passion is, is uh, can be overwhelming. And it can, it can drive one to avoid acting rationally. So what do we do in society, in a, in a civilized society, what we do is we say, you know what, this decision about punishment, punishment, we've identified the, the wrongdoer, the decision about punishment is going to be left to people who aren't so close, people who, who, are dis, who can administer justice, who can administer the, the appropriate response uh, in an even-handed, dispassionate way. Uh, taking into account the, the uh, severity of the crime. I mean, justice, the scales of justice uh, are scales because there should be balance in them. The wrong should be outweighed by the right, or, or weighed exactly the same as the right, an eye exactly for an eye, nothing more, nothing less. That's the principle of justice. And that, unfortunately, when you're raving mad at someone, raving angry, uh, can fail to happen. Now let's say that we decide then that it's uh, consistent with our own moral code, our own uh, code of, of, of self-preservation and pursuit of happiness, that people who are not so passionately uh, involved in an issue um, make the final decision about how to respond to a wrong. Well, who's going to pay their salaries to do that? You can't require another person to be a judge without compensating him, without him volunteering, voluntarily agreeing to be the judge. And you can't expect a person to sacrifice of themselves that time, that energy, um, for your own moral advancement, for your own, for your own advancement. Justice requires that if you're getting something from them, you give them something in exchange. Justice requires that they be paid. Now, if they want to volunteer, that's fine, but being a judge is a full-time occupation. There's enough crime to go around. 
and it's a practical necessity that we have dispassionate judges. That doesn't mean that we have the right to enslave people to become passionate, dispassionate judges. They need to be paid. And one might, might, one might logically conclude that that moral obligation to compensate a judge for having filled in for you, having uh, done what you weren't able to do because you were in this state of insane passion, that it's rational, that it's moral for him to compensate him to, to, to fill in for you like that. So some, some amount of revenue, obviously, is justifiable. Government cannot be expected to run for free, and I don't think it's even moral to expect it to run for free. Now, of course, you want to avoid as much as possible um, the use of coercion in any system of financing for government. And if you look at taxes on property, and those include outright taxes on wealth, you know, uh, capital tax on the sale, the, the capital gain uh, realized on the sale of property, or tax on just the very ownership of property. Well, those things are a punishment for doing good, a punishment for preserve, uh, for doing what what reality requires you to do, and that's to provide for yourself, to be productive. To my mind, there's no moral justification for a, a tax on property or a tax on the fruit of your, your endeavors, a tax on your income. Well, what about, what about a tax, if you want to call, talk about taxes, I'm, I'm not, there are many voluntary ways, trades that can be made between government and people. For example, one that's often raised but often meets with a lot of scorn is government can, can run a lottery. And, you know, I, I don't know how, uh, how much revenue could really be generated off of that and whether it would be enough to finance all the defensive role of government, but let's talk about for a sec, a sec it, whether or not there's even a tax that might fit the bill. Now, I'm not firmly decided on this. Uh, I'm going to have to think about it some more. But it, it, it occurs to me that a sales tax, unlike any other tax, <clears throat> a tax on sales makes sense. And I've discussed, actually, Bob Metz, uh, uh, <clears throat> I proposed to him in fact, uh, you'll see in the, the, the uh, policies of the Freedom Party of Ontario that the only tax that we don't object to, uh, at least at this point, is, the, uh, is a tax on sales. And initially my rationale for proposing this to everybody, and I did propose it to them, was that you know, with, a, with an income tax, if you're in business, you, you wake up one day and in your mail comes a, a bill that says, guess what, you owe us uh, <clears throat> $5,000 this quarter. Uh, or $10,000 this quarter. You've suddenly gone from being debt-free to being in debt. And why? Well, because you worked, and you produced, and you made things for this world. You wake up with a debt. Same thing with a property tax. You wake up with a bill that says, congratulations, you own a home, now give us some rent bought something that you really didn't buy, you're just renting it from a different person, renting it from the government. But what about a sales tax? Well, sales tax is a little different. If I pay somebody for a good or service, I've entered into a contract with that person. I've said, look, uh, and Bob, Bob Metz is, should be credited with this. He's the one who identified this fact as well. I think it really sews it, sews it up pretty well for me. but. You know, I'm open to I'm open to argument. Anyway, when you when you buy something from somebody, you are entering into a contract with that person. You're trading a thing for a thing. You're agreeing to trade a thing for a thing. That's the essence of a contract. And <clears throat> you might pay for something uh, that then isn't delivered. Now that would be called a breach of a contract. And in response to a breach of contract, we have courts and. Uh, and uh, police and etc. All of whom make sure that people keep their promises. They enforce promises. And they do it dispassionately. They're doing a service. And every time you pay for a good or 
a good or service, every time you enter into one of those contracts, you're effectively creating one more obligation, one more situation for the government to be um, in, in, you know, uh, monitoring or, or uh, policing. You're incurring, in fact, the, the workload. Uh, you're inc sorry, you're increasing, in fact, the workload for the government. Or at least the potential workload. So it might plausibly be argued that a tax on the money exchanged for the service, good or service is money paid ultimately by both parties because the, uh, the seller could have sold the good for a higher price if he didn't have, if his client didn't have to, uh, to pay tax. He could have just sold it for the, 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 sold, the whole price could have been, been the, uh, or sorry, all of the revenues could have gone to the seller instead of part of it going to the government. So both parties are really con contributing uh, money to the government when we have a sales tax. And maybe maybe both, uh, both parties should. Maybe both parties should, because they are both they are both expecting the government uh, to be at their beck and call should the other party to their transaction not uh, keep the contract. Anyway, we've moved all over the map today. I apologize if you were looking for something a little more co coherent. It's probably because I'm trying to pay attention to the road and, and uh, talk at the same time. By the way, I got this idea of, of taking you to work. Uh, there's a fellow named Stefan Molyneux, uh, who's a very intelligent man. He, he has a regular um, podcast, video cast. He's on YouTube. Uh, he's an anarcho-capitalist. He's a libertarian. He's not quite my cup of tea when it comes to politics, but I'll tell you, in terms of his, uh, the breadth of his knowledge of philosophy, it's, uh, it, it's quite broad and deep. Uh, you can see, I think, his videos on a... Um, I think his, his, his YouTube channel is called Free Domain or Free Domain Radio. I'm not sure which it is. Oh, sorry, it's not. It's called Steph Bot. S as in Sandra, T E F as in Frank, B O T, like robot. Uh, so, youtube.com slash Steph Bot. And he's got lots of video there to watch. I haven't watched most of it. <clears throat> but what I have seen seems pretty um, interesting. All right, we're pulling into my reserve spot here at work. It's reserved because I, coming in from Uxbridge, tend to get here later than a lot of people. And if it weren't reserved, I was finding on a lot of days um, the lot was full and I'd have to park across the street or etc. And on a rainy day like today, someone who's paying for rent shouldn't have to walk through the rain as far as, uh, as um, someone who isn't paying rent here. All right, I, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take this camera in with me and I'll show you my office. Oop, slag looks like a nice little bit of work. I'll have to replace that later. Hello, Nancy. Good morning, how are you? I'm good. Okay. I'm going to go in the office and show everybody the office. All right. Good morning, Yolanda. Uh -huh. <laughs> New camera? Oh Hi, Julie, how are you? Good, how are you? Always got the video part out. Yeah, that's right. How are you, Paul? I'm well. You may be on YouTube tonight. Hi, Jane. Hi, Paul. How are you? <laughs> What's your name, ma'am? Just for you, the YouTube community wants to know who the best real estate okay. wills and trusts and uh, you name it lawyer is in all of Oshawa. It's Jane Elizabeth Hughes, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> and say hi to YouTube. Hi, People? YouTube. There we go. Shanty, hiding. <laughs> hi, Shanty. Hi, Shanty. <laughs> She's so funny. You've Where is she? you got to be theatrical. you got to be theatrical. you on a stage. The world is watching you. Yeah, the world is a stage. <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I won't show you what's on my desk. I'll just show you. Oh, where we are? Where are we? Here we go. The death of Wolf. Right here over my computer. And there's the world. 
and there's the world to me, me and the kids. Yep. Well, I'm talking to everybody on YouTube. Here.